Hello grade 12 and welcome back to the Momentum and Impulse playlist. In today's video, we're going to be looking at the principle of conservation of linear momentum. This is a big one when it comes to the topic momentum and you are asked about this very often in your final exam. Remember to stay tuned till the end of the video where I do teacher tips. I show you how they ask this in exams. I show you things that students often do wrong. I show you how to market. You don't want to miss those things. If you've missed any other momentum videos in this playlist, check out the link in the description box below. Let's jump right in. The principle of conservation of linear momentum is an extremely important concept for you to understand. This principle pops up in almost every single paper that you get in grade 12. Now, let's start at the beginning. Let's define the principle of conservation of linear momentum. So what is it? you will be asked to state the principle of conservation of linear momentum. It's a definition that you need to learn, and it's above me on the screen. So, it says the total linear momentum in an isolated system is conserved. Now, two things here, or a few things here, rather, should I say. You can say is conserved, or you can say is constant. They mean the same thing. However, you have to say total. So it's not just the linear momentum in an isolated system is conserved. It's important to say total because what we're going to be doing is we're going to be considering all the objects in a system. So say, for example, we have two cars. We have a before situation. We have an after situation. Say in the before situation, they are heading towards each other. Okay, got car A and car B. We add up that momentum. Okay, so the initial momentum of the system. The system is car A and car B. Then they crash. Then after they crash, we're going to take A and B's momentum again and add them together. So you see how we're adding. We're getting a total. That's why you must say total. And what you would notice about the before and after situation is that those numbers should be the same if this principle stands true. So the total linear momentum in an isolated system is conserved. Obviously, we're just gonna ignore the fact that this is double D over there. Isolated system is conserved, which means it stays the same, which means before the crash, if you take A and B's momentum, it will equal A and B's momentum added together after the crash. Now you see how it says isolated system. In old definitions, old textbooks, your textbook may have said closed system. You have to say isolated. Just remember grade 12s, we use isolated in the context of physics, which momentum is a physics topic, and we use closed in the context of chemistry, a closed system in the context of chemistry. Okay, we're going to be doing that in chemical equilibrium. Now, back up for a second. What do we mean by system? What do we mean by isolated? Let's jump into that first before we actually get into the principle itself. So, when we speak about a system, we are talking about a collection of two or more objects that interact with each other. So, for example, in my car crash one, we had car A and car B. Those are two objects that interact with each other. So they collide into each other or you could get an explosion or something like that. Now, an isolated system, which is the systems that we work with in momentum in order for the principle to be upheld, is a system on which the resultant or net force is zero. Okay, it says here, or a system which excludes external forces. I would prefer for you guys to use that example, that definition over there. A system on which the resultant or net force is zero. We basically ignore things like friction and stuff in such a system. But let's take a close look at this principle and what it means. So here's an example of what I was saying to you. So we got car A, we got car B, they're traveling towards each other. This is before a collision. If I take the momentum of car A, let's say it's 100 kilograms meters per second. Ignore the magnitude in the direction, that, um, ignore the direction at the moment. I'm just looking at magnitude. And let's say B is 200 kilograms meters per second. Now that's before the collision. Then they collide. Now remember when a collision happens, they can stick to each other and move off as one unit. One can one car can go that way, the other one can the other one can go that way. But basically, what will happen is after the collision, remember before the collision, the total momentum was let's just pretend 300 kilograms meters per second. I know I'm not taking direction to account, but just you know, for simplicity's sake, after the collision, the total 
momentum should also be 300 kilograms meters per second. So that momentum is conserved. And this is how we write it out. Now, this is very, very important. Now, over here, I've got what I have total P initial equals total P final. Remember the definition? It says the total linear momentum and P means momentum. So the total momentum initially, so this could be like before a, before a crash or something, is equal to the total momentum after the collision or after the interaction. So total P final. Your teacher may use this symbol. That means sum of the initial momentum equals the sum of the final momentum. Now remember, in our system, we have two objects. We're going to be working with two objects. We have object A and we have object B. Now, remember, let's take a look at what we have over here. How would I work out the initial momentum of the system? Well, you would work out the P initial of object A plus the P initial of object B. I hope that makes sense to you, grade 12. The initial momentum, the sum of the initial momentum, that means we have to take the initial momentum of object A and add the initial momentum of object B. Okay? We do the same for final. So you see above me over here, we got P final. It would be the final momentum of object A plus the final momentum of object B. Now, what else do you know about momentum? How do you calculate momentum? Well, I hope you guys remember from our previous lessons that I'm going to do it in a little bubble over here. Momentum is equal to mass times velocity. So how would I expand this formula that I have over here? Well, you would do it as follows. The initial momentum of object A, that would be the mass of object A multiplied by the initial velocity of object A. Because remember, momentum is equal to mass times velocity. So momentum, that's initial momentum of object A, is equal to the mass of object A times the initial velocity of object A. So basically, I'm, I may as well put an equal sign over here. These two blue blocks are equal to each other. So I'm basically expanding the formula. Okay, then how would you do initial momentum of object B? Well, it would be the mass of object B and the initial velocity of object B. Just think of it like this, initial momentum, initial velocity. Then I'm sure you can imagine how we would do the final momentum of object A. It would still be the mass of object A because it's still object A, but the final velocity of object A plus the mass of object B plus the final velocity of object B. And now we have our formula that we can work with. So what you'll see in a question is they may give you the mass of both object A and object B. And if you think about it in terms of what I just did, then we would know the mass of object A, B, A, and B. We would know all of those terms. And then what they could do is they could give you the initial velocity that A and B were traveling at before they touched or collided or whatever. Then we would know the initial velocity of A, the initial velocity of B. And they could say after the collision, they could tell you the car A travels in the opposite direction. They could give you the velocity and then they will ask you to solve for the unknown. So essentially, when we apply these questions, we will be looking for one unknown variable. That's generally how these questions look. But before we get into that, I just want to show you some scenarios that we can expect. First things first, I just want you to make sure that you understand how to get from here to here. Now, when you write the formula in the exam, you don't have to do this whole thing. What you need to do for me is you can tell me the sum of the initial momentum is equal to the sum of the final momentum, and then give me this last line over here. Now, coming from a teacher, remember I teach up to matric, I set exams, I mark exams. One thing that some of my students forget is that this formula that's over here right next to me is not on the formula sheet. What is on the formula sheet is this formula in the little bubble above me. You need to know the principle of conservation of linear momentum. You need to know that it means total initial equals total final. And therefore, you need to know how to expand it into this form by yourself. So this long version of here is not on the formula sheets. You get there yourself, which is where a lot of students go wrong because they don't study. They forget that they must do that. They don't see it on the formula sheet. So therefore, they do the wrong thing. 
So using the formula in this form, like I showed you, is a pretty standard way to do it. You can always use it in this form. However, you may have a certain situation like what I mentioned where you have two objects colliding. So initially they are separate. We've got object one with its own initial velocity, object two with its own initial velocity. Then after they collide or they hit or they knock each other or something like that, they attach to one another and they move off with the same final velocity. So just picture it in your head. Two objects, they're initially separate, they come towards each other, they have their own initial velocities and then they get attached to one another and they move off with the same velocity. So how we can change the formula to accommodate that situation is by in the final scenario, because remember this is sum of initial momentum on the left hand side, and this is sum of final momentum on the right hand side. Uh, in the final situation, can you see here, this is the final situation, we adding the two masses together, putting it in brackets, and then they travel with the same final velocity, which is why I've done it like that. You don't have to though. You can still apply that first version of the formula to a situation where the objects stick together afterwards. We also get a situation where our objects were initially together and then they move apart. So that would be a situation like I have over here. You can see in my initial momentum, my objects M1 and M2 are together and they have the same initial velocity. So think of that as like a person on a skateboard their masses are together and they have the same initial velocity. And then the person jumps off the skateboard. Now they're separate objects with their own velocities. But what's good to know, if this freaks you out, all the different versions, is that you can always use the general formula, the generalized formula for all situations. So you don't have to stress. Let's do an example of this. So we've got car A, so there's our one object, traveling west at a constant velocity of 28 meters per second. So what I'm gonna do is all of car A's things, I'm gonna highlight in blue. It collides into the back of car B, traveling in the same direction at 16 meters per second. So we've got car A traveling west. Now, what I need you guys to understand is that you need to select or choose a positive direction. Now, because they say that car A is traveling west, it's initially traveling west, I'm going to choose west as my positive direction. So I'm going to write here to the west is my positive direction. Remember it goes north, east, south, west. Okay. So west is my positive direction. And this is car A and that's the initial velocity of A. It collides into the back of car B traveling in the same direction at 16 meters per second. So that is the initial velocity of car B. Now take note, because they were both initially traveling west, they're both going to have a positive velocity initially. After the collision, we've got car B moving west, so in the same direction, at 24 meters per second. Now please, grade 12s, take note. We chose west as positive. So that means the 28 will be positive because it's west. The 16 will be positive because it's west. And the 24 meters per second will be positive because it's west. If one of these cars traveled in the opposite direction after the collision, we would have to substitute that in as a negative. Then they give me the mass of car A, the mass of car B. They say friction is negligible, which means we have an isolated system, which is great. Determine the velocity of car A after the collision. So let's list out what we have. I know I've said a lot, but we've got the mass of A, which is 600 kilograms. We've got the mass of B, which is 900 kilograms. We've got the initial velocity of A, which is 28 meters per second. And I'm writing it here as a positive because we chose west as positive. B was traveling in the same direction, which means west. So the initial velocity for B is also 16 meters per second to the west, which means it's going to go in as a positive. After the collision car, B moves west, still west, at a velocity of 24 meters per second. So the final velocity of B is 24 meters per second, also a positive because we're going west, and they want us to determine the velocity of car A after the collision. So they want VF of A. Now, I hope you can see that we've got the mass of both. We've got the initial velocity of both. We've got the final velocity of one. Therefore, we have one unknown. 
Now take note how I first started off my question by saying the sum of the initial momentum equals the sum of the final momentum. Now I know I'm dealing with two objects, A and B, so I'm gonna go, okay, the initial momentum will be the mass of object A, the initial velocity of object A, plus the mass of object B, the initial velocity of object B. Then our final momentum will be the mass of A, the final velocity of object A, plus the mass of B and the final velocity of object B. Now, all we do is we substitute in our values. So mass of A is 600, initial velocity is 28, plus our mass of B is 900, initial velocity of 16. Our mass of A is 600, final velocity of A, we do not know, so I'm leaving it as VF A plus our mass of B is 900, initial velocity of 24. Before I go on, just a teacher tip. Now listen to me very carefully. If, and I did mention this, but I'm gonna say it again. If your cars at any point went to the east, you would have to substitute their velocities in as negative. So remember here, we are substituting it in as a positive, as a positive, as a positive. That's because we chose to the west as positive and they keep telling us that they're going in the west, they're going in the west, they're going in the west. But if it was a, if it was an easterly direction that one of them was moving in, we'd have to substitute it in as a negative. Now we isolate our variable and sometimes my matrix struggle with this. So I'm just going to explain how we do it. We work out the left hand side. So 600 times 28 plus 900 times 16. So get an answer there. So what I've done is I've multiplied these two together, I've multiplied these two together, I've added them together, get 31,200, then I've multiplied 900 times 24 and I've got 21,600. Now remember, we're trying to isolate our variable, which is our final velocity of A. So what I do is I take 31,200 minus that 21,600 and I'm going to get 9,600. So I've got 9,600 on the one side and I've got, let's just do it like this. I've got 9,600 on the one side and I've got 600 final velocity of A. Now, this is multiply by 600. This is my variable. This is multiply by 600. So when I take the 600 over, it's gonna be 9,600 divided by 600 and I get my final velocity. I'm just gonna do the answer up here. For A is 16 meters per second and take note how it came out as a positive. Now, what does that mean? That means that it's going to the west. Okay, I hope that makes sense to you guys. In the next video, I'll be going over some past paper examples. Again, giving you a teacher tip, showing you where your marks go and where you can make mistakes. I'll see you then. Remember to subscribe for more physics. Bye everyone.